Hello, everyone. Uh, Stephen Lyman here with uh, Show Tuesday from Japan Distilled. And uh, it's been a couple weeks. We haven't been on for a while. I apologize for that. I uh, got back from, from travel in the States and immediately took ill, uh, feeling better, as hopefully you can you can tell. And uh, but and Christopher's actually on his he's on a flight back to Japan. So next week we will be uh, back together again for the first time in quite a while. Uh, Maya filled in for us for a couple of weeks before we took a couple of weeks off, and thanks to her for that. And we're here with Matt Alt, uh, who some of you probably know from his other interests, but he also has a keen interest in Japanese alcohol. And he and I originally bonded over uh, Jokichi Takamine and vintage Japanese cocktails, meaning cocktails that were created originally here in Japan. Uh, so welcome, Matt. Thanks for thanks for joining. Well, us. thanks for having me on, and thanks for the uh, Takamine style uh, uh, whiskey the other day. It's a uh, it's an amazing, amazing uh, libation. Yeah, my pleasure. We uh, we were able to share a bottle uh, in Tokyo with, with Christopher, and then a friend of yours. The four of us were able to sample the Takamine yes. Oji whiskey, and yes. and then it turned out your friend was a pretty incredible expert on. Japanese yeah, cocktail. he's a uh, he, he's a he's a drinks historian himself. He isn't really widely published in America. His name isn't really in English at all. Um, but he is a sort of expert in that Meiji to Taisho democracy era of cocktail culture and how cocktail culture uh, was imported to Japan and uh, how it kind of flourished on the uh, on the on the streets, so to speak, of places like the Ginza and uh and things like that so he is a uh, i'll introduce his stuff a little bit later but he is a he's a really great guy who is um just kind of my guide through i would say vintage cocktail history which is mainly my thing i'm, I'm much more into the cocktail history than i am into the actual uh, uh spirits themselves although i love that stuff too sure yeah i mean i think what was most fascinating for me with that uh, afternoon that we spent together was uh, the being able to try the same cocktail but with different con different recipes from different eras. Yes, right. yes, that yes, definitely because things change. You know, the 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 liquors that we get on our our shelves today are not as uh, you know. I think they're more refined probably than what was available a long time ago, and certainly the the mixing ingredients have changed. Um, you know, and things like that we take for granted, like cocktail onions, you know, they, they mm. weren't available or, or olives even, they weren't available in Meiji Taisho. So, you know, Tamura-san, um, Shingo Tamura, who is our, our kind of, who we, we had drinks with the other night, is sort of an expert at walking modern day bartenders in Japan through how to reconstruct old cocktails like that. And we had a bunch. We had, I think the, the one that was the most interesting is there's a cocktail called the Japanese. And it was... Mm created in America uh, when the very first legation, which is a diplomatic mission, came over from the shogunate. This is like right after Perry sailed in, Admiral Perry sailed in in 1853 and, and forcibly opened Japan's ports. Um, and when he, when he came back to sign that treaty, he had huge amounts of liquor on board the, 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 the battleship, basically and invited Japanese on. And that was probably the first time Japanese had ever drunk high proof distilled spirits um, on those, in those kind of landing parties and stuff. And when the, the shogunate sent a diplomatic mission to Washington DC, actually they went to a, a number of cities in America, San Francisco, uh, New York city, uh, Washington DC. It was a cause of great celebration. This is like in the 18, late 1850s in America, early 1860s. Um, and, the uh, local bartender uh, in, in, in New York City invented this cocktail called the Japanese. And <laughs> it doesn't really have, it doesn't include any Japanese ingredients at all. It's, it's completely Western based. It uses bitters. Uh, it uses large amounts of like orge uh, bitters and uh, uh, it's whiskey based, I believe. And uh, it's a, uh, <laughs> like, so Tamura-san's Tamura -san's idea is that that this is what Westerners couldn't really make a difference between Japan and China at the time. And there were mm -hmm. probably large amounts of shokoshu. Uh, what do you call that in English, by the way? Shokoshu, the Chinese sweet Chinese, kind of... Yeah, the 
We have, what is that stuff called in English? Is it Ch- you know what I'm talking about, right? Chinese Chinese rice wine, basically. Yeah, oh, and it's it's right. very sweet. It's yeah. a kind of dark liquor. It, it's it's very sweet, and uh, I'm sorry, the Japanese is brandy based, and okay. so it's brandy based, or it's brandy or jay and huge amounts of bitters. Okay. And Mr. Tamura's thesis is that Americans didn't have any access to sake or anything Japanese at the time, mm-hmm. but there were large numbers of Chinese people in America. And so he believes that this cocktail is an American's attempt to replicate what shokoshu tastes like that Chinese. It's also, it's often drunk with a little bit of sugar in it too. shokoshu. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, um, and it's dark, it's very fragrant. Yeah. Anyway, so we, uh, to get back to your point, uh, we were drinking variations on that at the bar in Tokyo, and that was a lot of fun that Tamura-san had come up with based on a recipe from 1870, 1890, yeah. 1920, 1960. So yeah. that was a lot of fun. They got progressively more uh, palatable and interesting until probably that <laughs> 1920 version, and then once you got to 1960, it was just all sugar. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's funny, like, the really old cocktails, like the, the ones from, like, the, you know, 19th century, I think are often masking what the liquor probably tasted like back then. It wasn't really, you know, there's no FDA, there's no, like, ATF, there's nobody, like, you know, actually, <laughs> you know, licensing or, or checking what what how people are making stuff, but... Um, and then as, as, like you say, as it gets to the sixties, everything just gets incredibly sweet. So there's a yeah. kind of sweet spot, I think pre prohibition, like immediate pre prohibition is when the cocktails were really at their swingingest best. That's right. Yeah. And I think, I think we have a, obviously, you know, current cocktail culture is, is reviving that where we're getting back to more sophisticated oh, absolutely. flavor expressions and, and finding the way that the different ingredients can contrast and balance and enhance. Uh, the drink. Definitely. I, I just as a complete aside, but as you were talking, made me think of it. I had an incredible non-alcoholic cocktail when I was in Portland, Oregon. Really? Um, and I've, I, I, I was trying several of them on my trip because it's those are kind of having a moment. Um, and you think, you know, why are you paying twelve or fifteen dollars for something without any booze in it? Well, they can actually be pretty delicious. And they're using yeah. high quality, you know, muddled fruits and things like that. And so they're, yeah. you know, you're getting a good drink. But one that I had in in Portland was at uh, uh, izakaya called takibi okay and takibi is actually in the uh first floor of the snow peak usa headquarters offices in Portland. okay and so it's actually an izakaya run by snow peak and okay. they put together an incredible bar bar program with really really great bartenders from around the country they actually brought people from new orleans oh, wow. and other parts of the country to come in and and really make this a place and the and the cocktail that i had i can't remember all of the ingredients off the top of my head but it was this perfect balance of like uh, sweet, spicy, fruity, and then it had like a turmeric tincture. Oh, interesting. Like that. It interesting. gave it like just this really, really interesting profile and this beautiful orange color. And it was fantastic. And it was the first time I really felt like I had a memorable mocktail. Well, no, and, you know, it's funny because I think most of the mocktails you get in Japan are vinegar based. They're based mm-hmm. on uh, a kind of shrub. Shrub based stuff, right? And I like that. I like those things too. Um, but th- this one you're talking about sounds kind of different than that. That's right. Yeah, this was a, a creation by one of the bartenders there at uh, Takibi, and it was uh, it was delicious. It was really, really fantastic. Um, so it's good to know that these things are starting to appear. Yeah, definitely, things. definitely. Well, you know, and it's it's. I, I think it, it mirrors trends kind of globally in which people are kind of getting progressively less boozy. Um, mm-hmm. You know, there's a, I, I am not really a, a huge drinker of, of non-alcoholic or, or low alcoholic uh, uh, beverages, but recently uh, Yaho or Yoho, I believe they're called, the, the brewery in Japan released this uh, low alcoholic IPA called Shojiki no Satan or like Sincere Satan. And it's 0.7% alcohol, but because of the large amount of hops being used, it actually tastes like something, mm. you know, unlike, unlike most, you know, a non-alcoholic beers, which kind of tend to have this sort of chemically lagery sort of flavor to them. And I was like, wow, you yeah. know, if, if things continue in this direction, I could see drinking this kind of stuff more regularly. You know what I mean? Sure. Yeah, yeah, and a little bit less alcohol is not necessarily a bad thing. I, I had a, a 1% beer that was imported from, I think, Sweden. Oh, interesting. Uh, the craft beer that's available here in Fukuoka. And I think how they arrested the fermentation is they it actually had salt in it. They actually oh, had wow. salt for fermentation to, to keep the yeast from getting too active. And you ended up with this nice, 
you know, and salt can can add, you know, especially as a summer refresher, salt's actually kind of an important sure. component. So it was a, it yeah. was a really interesting beer. Uh, well, don't people yeah. salt their beers in the in American South? Like, I, I think actually salting your beer is like a is a is a is a deep South kind of thing. Is it? Yeah, I never yeah. never saw that when I was living there, but yeah. um, maybe people did. My grandfather put ice in his beer. That was about as oh. strange as I, as I saw. He just liked it to stay cold. <laughs> right. Yeah. 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 So, but cool. it's, no, um, I, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. So I guess getting back to the maybe we'll continue on the Japanese cocktail. Sure, things a little bit before well, I, we get into the main event with with Takamine. Yeah, but, no, I just it's interesting. You were talking about an American izaki uh, that you went to that introduced this non alcoholic beverage to you because I think that the the ironic thing is, and I don't know how well known this is in the states, but the entire kind of cocktail boom of the aughts, uh, you know was really kicked off when Westerners discovered that Japanese cocktail bartenders, especially in the Ginza, were mm -hmm. had maintained this, uh, what David Wondrich calls this kind of international bartending style that had been popularized, I think, on cruise ships and things, you know, going, plying the, the, the world in the, in the pre-flight era. Um, mm -hmm. And Japanese are really good at following, you know, kind of learning and then mimicking and, and keeping and holding on to patterns. And so the types of cocktails that you would see and the types of mixology that you would encounter, particularly in, in, in high class kind of Ginza clubs, what mm -hmm. really was a, a time capsule of what bartending had been like in America and, and globally at, in, in the kind of roaring 20s and, and mm -hmm. 30s and things like that. And um, it, it, I think when Westerners started to realize that this culture had, which had been lost post prohibition in America, was still mm -hmm. alive somewhere, they started to kind of learn from these people. And this is where you get like the hard shake, you know, mm -hmm. and all of these Japanese, like, you know, barware, all of these mixers and like, you know, uh, bitters, drippers, and, and, and stirrers and things like that that kind of filtered into the American bartending scene at the, mm -hmm. in the aughts. It all came from Japan, and I think it's really funny because you know it, we don't really tend to think of Japanese as innovators when it comes to uh, uh, you know cocktails. And it's, in those Ginza bars, they don't use a lot of like infusions or like fat washed or like any of these kind of cutting edge things you see in Western bars. But they're really good at kind of maintaining a sort of culture, uh, a sort of stasis. It's a kind yeah. of fun conservatism, you know. It's like we're doing it like yeah. my sensei taught me to do it. Who's sensei? taught him how to yeah. do it so there's yeah, that no, kind of no japan doubt. link yep no you're absolutely right i think any you, you know you, you go to those bars in ginza and you're still getting a tuxedoed bartender yes, right? yes. he might be 20, 25 with hair that just doesn't make sense <laughs> directionally or or with any sense of gravity but he's still wearing a tuxedo and he's going to make your drink very precisely and yes. and it doesn't matter what you order there's often no menu yeah you just order the cocktail that you want and he will make it he knows how and it often takes quite a long time, even though they're they're doing pretty standard stuff, part because those clubs are designed to kind of, those bars are designed to kind of slow things down. They're made for salarymen, Japanese businessmen who are kind of conducting kind of a business ritual. They're not meant for, you know, young people who are like, hey, man, what's the newest hot thing? You know, hey, bring it on, bro. They're, they're not that kind of scene at all, which can kind of lead to. Uh, friction sometimes. Um, mm -hmm. I actually, I actually kind of discourage people from going to to places like that in the Ginza because they're not really designed for tourists. Mm -hmm. But they, you know, like Star Bar and stuff like that, uh, these famous yep. ones. But they're, you know, they're they're definitely little kind of jewels of Japanese cocktail culture. Yeah, no question. I think you know if you go with that expectation, you know that you, your drink is going to take a while. Then you savor it, and if you are, if you want to pick up the pace a little bit, you order your next drink when the when yeah, the first, first thing, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> definitely, and definitely. By the, time you, by the time you finish that little coop of of whatever you ordered, then you're gonna get your next one. So, um, and I, I actually really enjoy going in and just doing bartender's choice, giving them a base spirit, and let them figure yeah. out what they want to make with it. And uh, I'm yes. never disappointed because everything. Oh yeah, be well made. Definitely. So, there's a, yeah. there's a lot of places like the Bar High Five. I don't know if they have a menu. Like you just go in there and they're like, well, what what kind of cocktails do you like? You know, it's almost like at the at the best of these places, it's almost like therapy sessions. You know, mm -hmm. like oh, what kind of what kind of cocktails do you? Oh, are you a sweet? Are you like a more of a savory? You know what I mean? Do you like yeah. you know that kind of thing? And you have this. It's almost like being analyzed on the couch. You know? <laughs> right. Right. <laughs> is it Bar High Five that has those incredible wooden chairs? Is that the one, or is that Little Smith? One of them Bar has like each. 
I don't think that's bar. The best thing about bar fi- high five is that Ueno san, the, the bartender, doesn't drink. He's a, he's a complete okay. teetotaler. He's just, uh, you know, he doesn't have the genes, the genetics to do it. So yep. he's never even tasted the stuff that he's, that he's been funny. serving up, but he's a great, he's a great bartender. You know, I think then it must, maybe it's Little Smith that I'm thinking of where they, yeah. you're sitting in like about a $5,000 handmade wooden chair. Oh, wow. Yeah. That's different. When you're sitting yeah. at the bar. So when, when you, when you say therapy session, you can right. take a nap in these things. They're so comfortable. Right. They're That's wooden. True. They're wooden, but they're still just super comfortable. They just somehow fit your body just right. Right. And so you right. just you don't want to leave. You just want to sit there and have another drink. And it's a it's right. a wonderful experience. It's also hard to find because I think it's like B3 in a random. Yeah, a lot of these thing, a right? lot of these places. Well, like, you know, for instance, there's a there's a bar in the Ginza called Lupin. Um, mm-hmm. and it is a famous, famous bar. It's been there for like close to a hundred years, I think. There's a really famous photo of the the nihilistic author Osamu Dazai perched on a on a stool soused out of his mind uh and loving it uh that's a very famous picture from Japanese uh literature uh that was taken there and that stool is still there you can sit in the corner like him but they serve up a cocktail that's one of the few I don't think it was made in Japan but it was popularized in Japan it's called the bamboo and mm-hmm. it is a cocktail that is, as you probably know, it's one of the one of the few popular cocktails that doesn't have any liquor in it. it it's it's vermouth and sherry with bitters, mm-hmm. and very mm-hmm. astringent. Um, it, it really feels like you're you're kind of, you know, I, I can imagine it like the the Grand Hotel in Yokohama. You're standing on the balustrade watching the, you know, the watching the steamships go by and having a little pick me up in the afternoon kind of taste to it. You know what I mean? Yep, yep. It's yep. uh and you can get that at Lupin. It's basically the only cocktail they serve there. <laughs> but uh <laughs> there's very few like kind of cocktails that are like Japanese that, that have taken off mm-hmm. around the world, I think. The Japanese That's cocktail right. that we talked about earlier isn't Japanese at all. So Right, right. Yeah. Yeah. It's <clears throat> it's a it's it is really, really fun that to, to explore these places and and you're right, you know, with as far as you know, the making the drink itself <clears throat> is a performance in a lot of ways, right? The precision. And you know, you were talking about the the bar equipment. You know, the three piece shaker fell out of favor in the states because it took too long, right. yeah. and yet it makes such a precise drink compared yes. to using the the two piece shaker, right? Which we're used to seeing in in American bars when people are just throwing together a margarita or whatever. You know, yes, well, I, I think patience. Quick... There's a lot less patience now. Back in time, you know, people didn't slide, sidle up to the bar with an iPhone. You know, you, you went up mm-hmm. there to get some kind of conversation, and that's why. I, you know, Tamara-san, who we were talking about, he, I haven't actually seen this yet, but he walked a bartender through how to make a blue blazer, which is okay. the cocktail that you see. It's on the cover of David Wondrich's Imbibe with the guy with the two cups and flame going in between them. You would, okay. you would actually pour flaming liquid from, from shaker to shaker before putting it into the, uh, uh, the customer's glass. And as you can imagine, it's kind of a you know difficult thing to do without setting the entire place on fire. Sure. So uh, I don't think it's performed very much. It's a very kind of elaborate sort of thing. But uh, it, it, it you know that that's the kind of that's the kind of showmanship you're talking about. It the kind of extreme form of it. Yeah, yeah. There's a couple of bars. Uh, one that I've been to, and another that I've heard about. Where when when you order your drink, a spotlight comes on, and <laughs> and and basically on the hands of the bartender so that you can watch him build your drink. And then when that, when he's finished, he, the light goes back off and the bar goes dim again. And so you did music you with know. that though. Like here's right. your drink, you know, like <laughs> kind of like a crooner, like a Vegas crooner when your drink comes out. Right. 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 <laughs> yeah, no, it's, it's, of course it's always accompanied by like some nice jazz or something, you know, sure. in these places, but the, 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 there was a bar, I think it's might be bar K. I'm going to forget the name right now, but in Kyoto, where whenever you whenever somebody orders at a highball, they actually have a button behind the bar. They press the light, and there's a spotlight in the bar shooting up. So when they put the glass there with the ice in uh-huh. it, it just looks like crystal. Then the whiskey goes in, and the stir, and the soda, and everything. And it's just a it's a it's fun to watch. Yes. You know, yeah. A, well, that you know the visuals have always been really important. Like the I looked into the kind of carving of 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 ice balls when I was writing. Mm-hmm. I wrote an article on cocktail history for the Japan Times about five years back. And it was always a visual thing. And, you know, first they started out kind of looking like meteor dimple shaped. And then like, you know, people made them smoother. And then I believe it was Ueno-san of High Five, who when he was working at Star Bar, apprenticing there, he came up with the idea of carving it into a diamond shape, like actually. Mm-hmm. And so he still does this, you know, that yeah. and when the light in the bar hits the drink, it, it really. And this is mainly, I, I think, for kind of single malt 
you know, it's not really a sure. cocktail thing. It's it's meant for highlighting a, a single spirit mm -hmm. type thing. But when the light hits it, it really glimmers. And uh, I just, I don't know, I love that. I, I love that visual. Pre There's so many, you know, in Japan, you've probably heard this word before, otaku, which is like kind of an obsessive fan of something. And there's a lot of liquor and, and cocktail otaku running these bars uh, yep. in Japan. And after, you know, that night when, when we first met and, and we were sharing Takamine's whiskey, uh, you know, you and Chris and, and Tamagasan and I split up to go our, our separate ways. I was trying to go home and then Tamagasan pulled me into a bar and this was in the back alley of Nakano that specializes in nothing but vintage liquors. Like you have okay. to go through this little hobbit door to get in there. And it's like, they only have Gordon's gin, but it's like Gordon's gin from like 1958. <laughs> you know, like they only have Tanqueray, you know, but again, it's like, and he, he's winning these things off auctions and, and, and trading with other people, but there's no liquor like earlier. It, it's not aged liquor. It's, 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 yeah. it's literally antique liquor from right. the time period. So it's really fun to, to go in there and have, oh, okay, I'll, I'll have a martini made with, you know, Okay, this 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 vermouth is from nineteen seventy three, and so is the liquor. Yeah. Um, it's uh, I love those kind of niche, obsessive, oh, sure. you know, spots in in Tokyo. Yeah. I'm sure they have them in Fukuoka where you live too. But yeah, you uh, can find these kinds of places in Japan, but that, that really is lost, I think, in most of the rest of the world. And yeah, um, the and in fact, I although you know you can still collect these things, you can still find these things in the states. I was actually given a sample of 1930s overproof Jamaican pot still rum. Wow. A little tiny wow. little bottle uh, by by a friend of mine who's a, a bit of a spirits nut. And it was gorgeous. I bet. So I, I ended up taking it out, uh, was out with a couple of friends of mine the other night here in Fukuoka, and we stopped by um, Yatai Bar Ebichan, which okay. if, if and when you're back in Fukuoka, we will definitely. Uh, definitely, definitely. There. It's a full cocktail bar in a Yatai. Oh, that is great. Yacht. I love it. I love it. Very Japanese. Very yeah. Japanese. And I, I shared the I shared the, the 1930s overproof with my friends and with the bartender. And he couldn't drink because he's got to drive home at the end of, the, of his uh, shift. But, but he, he could nose it a little bit. Yeah. And I left a little bottle with him so he could enjoy the aroma. Well, I bet uh, that the nose must have been nice on that. It was. It was it was really, really nice. And and then like I I've even just scouring liquor stores in Fukuoka I've been able to find. I think I found a 1960s old overhold. Uh, oh, wow. Some, some uh, pre-fire uh, bottlings from, uh, what was the uh, distillery that burnt down in, uh, in the 90s? One of the big, one of the big whisk. Uh, yeah, I know, I don't, I'm, not, I'm not that up on this, but I know those bottles of old overhold go for quite a lot. There was a, yep. there was a find of, a big find of pre-prohibition uh, liquor in the, in the house of a, a famous Hollywood director who had passed away in the sixties and had been boarded up by his teetotaler, uh, uh, you know, relatives. And they opened it up. This, this happened just a couple of years ago. I forget the oh, name of the you. director, but they, they have a huge collection from prohibition of his, you know, old overhold to like all of these old classic brands, uh, mint condition. Mm -hmm. I'm sure that stuff yeah, wow. sold for a fortune at auction. Oh, no doubt. No doubt. Yeah. Huh. So, so uh, yeah, why don't maybe we'll shift to our main event. We, we've been kind yeah. of, this is quite a long introduction, but uh, so, and we did have one, sorry, before I go to that, we did have one, looks like Mark is drinking actually soju. Oh, uh, nice. I've not heard of this uh, Hemosu brand, but. Uh, is that Japanese? I Hemosu? don't think they're saying soju, so I think it's. Yeah, probably it probably sounds Korean, Korean, probably. Soju. I said, yeah, Korean soju. Uh, sorry. Yeah, our main event then is, uh, sorry, I misspelled Jokichi. I can't believe that. I should, I'm, oh. that's a fireable offense. Let me fix that. Joke, you have to, and you have to put the, the um, not the umlaut. What is it? The long line over the joke. Yeah, yeah. We should over we should the, talk about. Jo I, I totally forgot. We should talk about joke. So. Yeah. Okay, I think I got it right. This is this is what you're <laughs> requesting. Show. Okay. So Christopher normally. Oh, you did put the line over it. Great. Yeah, yeah. Good to go. <laughs> so yeah, Jokichi Takamine. I think you and I both become obsessed with this man, um, and he legitimately was the first Japanese person that we know of that made whiskey. And how we know he did it before Masataka Taketsudo is he was doing it the year that Taketsudo was born. Yeah, he's, yes. Which is, he's quite predates Taketsudo. Yes. And of course, I think Taketsudo is rightly the Japanese, the father of Japanese whiskey because the malt style has ended up 
sure. dominating. Sure, sure, uh, sure, sure. But Takamine was making a Koji-based whiskey in Illinois in 1894-1895, which is just crazy to think about. It's astounding. It's astounding. I mean, so t- for those for those not in the know, Takamine Jokichi was a he was kind of the the, the chemist Tony Stark of of Japan <laughs> to use the Marvel comics. They he was this kind of genius chemist whose discoveries uh, such as adrenaline, he is the first person to isolate adrenaline, which was at then the only way to, to treat asthma. Uh, like there had been no treatment for it before then. And now we use adrenaline in all sorts of places. And also enzymes, uh, diastase uh, enzymes and things like that. And through these, these discoveries and, and inventions, he amassed a fortune. He, he made a lot of money and became what we would now know as an industrialist, I guess. And so yep. he, he moved to America and there's these great photos of him. He's in the suit. He's got like the mustache. Like he looks like your idea of like a turn of the 20th century, robber baron, you know, the pocket yep. watch, you know, the, yep. the glasses. Yep. And he's great. But I, I, he wasn't a robber baron. He was actually very dedicated to U.S. Japan relations and his inventions were really intended kind of for the for the improvement of mankind you know to, to, to help people uh mm-hmm. most importantly whiskey uh yeah. he was, <laughs> and actually he wasn't like a he wasn't like a liquor baron or anything like that um mm-hmm. I, I think that that the whiskey was an, an early attempt to use his diastase wasn't it his enzymes wasn't wasn't that you're, you're yeah. more up so, on that particular aspect yeah so he me. actually he, he got he did a uh so a little bit of context. He he was a uh, son of a samurai physician, um, and his mother came from a sake brewing family. So he had presumably grown up around fermentation. Uh, and then his fa- his his father was a specialist in rengaku or Western learning, Dutch learning. And so when Jokichi was old enough, he got sent to Nagasaki to go study English and rengaku, and ended up uh, living with a Portuguese family there. And then very quickly ended up you know, Osaka, Kyoto, just he was bouncing around. But he basically was on scholarship from his local domain because he was such a bright young man. Uh, and this is this is as Meiji starting up. This is he was born in 1854. So basically when the treaty was signed to open, yeah. open Japan uh, with those 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 barrels of, of whiskey that. Uh, <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. Like port wine, okay. Madeira. Yeah. Whiskey. Yeah. Exactly. It's all in there. Right. Too bad he missed that. But yeah. he went on to but do he, many other amazing things, too. And and like many young Japanese men at the time, he ended up uh, working for the government because that's where anybody right. with a decent education ended up working because those are the best paying jobs. And he ended up, uh, he was sent to Scotland to study to get, uh, I think, a master's degree there, at least do some graduate studies. And then he ended up working for the Department of Agriculture. And there he had his main responsibilities were to understand, I think it's called superphosphate, which is basically the chemical used to make fertilizer. Uh, Because Japan didn't have any fertilizer industry to speak of. And so that was one of his responsibilities to learn about and to study. And then uh, the other was patent law. These these were his his main responsibilities for the Department of Agriculture. And he ended up going on mission to the U.S. where he met and fell in love with an American woman. And uh, he ended up, I believe, leaving the government at that point and and going and making a fortune in phosphate mining. Because that's what one does when you want to marry an heiress. (laughs) <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Yeah. It was funny. Yeah, like he really, you know, he said, I, I need to get rich. And then like he yeah, did. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> it's, in, in like a year. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, mean, and, I think it helps when you come from a like a really elite background like he did. Yeah, like this was a connected sure. guy. This was like a, he didn't, he, he wasn't a bootstrap, you know, up from poverty yeah. guy. Like he was, he right. was like a lot of Japanese innovators, like, you know, Morita from Sony, like these guys were rich to begin with, but yeah, yeah. not to take away from his achievements. Sure. No, he would, he would end up being successful in many, many different ways. Now, when he came back to Japan with his with his new bride, uh, he actually ended up becoming the head of the Japanese patent office. He was right. 31 years old and he's running the patent office for the entire country. And that's when he realized that he could patent all sorts of Japanese things overseas. So he got patents for using koji to, to create alcohol in both the U.S. and the U.K., he also got the same patents in in I believe those two countries plus maybe Holland for essentially what's koji diastase. So basically using the uh, amylase and protease enzymes that that koji pre- creates during fermentation to create a digestive aid, which he right. he branded as taka diastase, and that actually was another fortune for him. Uh, and really, I mean, the alcohol was one of his experiments, and one of the things he ended up selling to the Illinois Whiskey Trust, the patent. The license for the patent, but right. it, it ended up being one of his least successful 
innovations because right, the whiskey right. never actually made it to market uh, due to the Sherman Act breaking up the Illinois Whiskey Trust. So, well, and then there's also that that whole thing about his distillery getting burned to the ground by the by the furious malters who were being uh, on the verge of being made extinct by this new process that he was uh, proposing to use. That maybe you can maybe you can because I know you're more up on this. So Ta Takamine's whiskey was not whiskey as we know it. Um, it yeah, wasn't his, malted barley, right? He was using koji in the process. That's right. He was using koji to sacrify the grains in replacement of malting. So uh, they both do the same thing. Koji breaks starches into sugars. Malt malting breaks down the starches into sugars. They're just one is using heat and moisture, and the other is using a, a mold to do it. And koji fermentation has been around for in Japan for alcohol production for thirteen hundred years. I mean, monks of Nara were making sake using koji from the 700s, and so and you know he grew up he grew up around around this uh, you know with his mother from a sake making family, so right. he's, he'd he'd known about it, and he realized that you could apply it to to making alcohol generally, and if you put it in a still, then you've got a distilled spirit, and then if you put it in a barrel, if it's made from grain, then it's a whiskey in America. Malt. You don't have to use malt to make whiskey in America. Right. You have to you have to use malt to make whiskey in Scotland and now in Japan. Right. Uh, so the Takamine, it wasn't even branded as Koji uh, whiskey. It was it was called the Takamine process. They right. named it after him, and it was it was a maltless whiskey. That's how it was described. Of course, the maltsters weren't happy, uh, and there was a mysterious fire in the Manhattan distillery in Peoria, Illinois, where they were doing the experiments. Right. And it took them like almost three years to rebuild the distillery and and start production fortunately the illinois whiskey trust had very deep pockets so it's it's not like the fire ended. right yeah you know, well yes the, definitely i also think it's it's really interesting you know it might seem kind of odd that looking back that at this point in the late 19 in the late 19th century that somebody would use a japanese name to try to market a product or a process because you know america was not exactly open and welcoming toward people of color, you know, back then, certainly. And, um, but Japan was an exception. There was a huge boom for things Japanese uh, after, that, that lasted for quite some time after Perry opened the ports and that legation came over in the early 1860s. Uh, mm -hmm. And it, it, it kind of blossomed mainly in Europe. We know it as Japanism, uh, you know, mm -hmm. the Impressionists, Van Gogh, Monet, you know, they're the Impressionist painting are all deeply influenced by ja their Japanese art. But it wasn't just art, like all sorts of things that we take for granted, like bungalows, the, the mm -hmm. term bungalow, they're based on Japanese architecture and things like that. So the idea that a Japanese person was making whiskey might have actually seemed cutting edge and cool uh, mm -hmm. in, in the 1850s. And, you know, I think Takamine is, is, is a kind of architect of, of that Japanism, you know, cool factor, if you want to call it that. So there's a kind of cultural backdrop to all of this happening as well, that a Japanese guy is able to, you know, kind of come to America, Europe and America and make a fortune for himself and then become a kind of mover and shaker in so many industries, mm -hmm. including uh, liquor yeah. and whiskey is kind of a testament to, I think, the regard in which things Japanese were held back then. Yeah, and I think I think analogous to that part of when when he was first mentioned in the U.S. press, he was he was he was uh, basically described as royalty because right. he was from the samurai class. So I think yes. there was a misunderstanding about just how high ranking his family was. But I think Americans at that time there was a little bit of a you know European royals were were put on a pedestal, and I think somebody from Japanese royalty got similar treatment. And I think that's probably why this this American heiress was actually willing to consider yeah. uh, marrying him. Was, was well, no, I don't think people knew what a samurai was. Do you know what I mean? I don't think there was, exactly. I mean, there's a lot of misconceptions about what samurai are now. I can only imagine like 18, 1878, you know yeah. what I mean? But he must have seemed a pretty, so he, didn't he first come over to the States for the, the New Orleans? Uh, right. There was like a big cotton expo or something, wasn't it? It was, the, it, was the, it was the World Expo. So it was, the, it, and the cotton cotton expo was part of that. And that's where he was studying the, the phosphates, the, the superphosphate and ended up, Actually, his first customer for his phosphate business to sell fertilizer was uh, a Louisiana farming conglomerate. That makes sense. I mean, New Orleans yeah. was such a major port for exchange. Mm -hmm. New Orleans, it's funny to think about it. You don't think of New Orleans and Japan as having like a, a big connection now, but they did back then. Mm -hmm. And Takamine, Takamine lived in a house on the edge of the French Quarter, uh, mm -hmm. and it's still there. And in fact, when my wife Hiroko and I visited New Orleans in 2019, 
we went to see it and noticed it was being renovated and actually convinced the, uh, the, the work crew. There was a Vietnamese family that had been hired to renovate it to let us in. And we actually managed to go and walk around. All of the original fixtures are still there. There was original furniture still there. Wow. Um, and it was really, you know, Takamine was not a guy who moved to New Orleans and stayed shut up in his house. Like he entertained, mm -hmm. he, yep. he, he made a lot of connections with people. And one of those was uh, somebody who I is very near and dear to my heart, Lafcadio Hearn, uh, mm -hmm. who we know as the first person to, to kind of popularize a lot of Japanese fairy tales, myths, legends, mm -hmm. religious stories and things like that without like he was the first person to write yokai stories, Japanese kind of mm -hmm. monsters and ghosts and things like that. But when when he met Takamine, he was just a he was a journalist specializing in like gruesome descriptions of local murders and things like that. And, yep. and like kind of offbeat. He's the one who actually popularized uh, Marie Laveau, the, the voodoo queen of New Orleans. He tracked her down and is it's only through Lafcadio's writings that we know about things like this uh, mm -hmm, in New mm -hmm. Orleans history. But he met Takamine. Takamine is like, hey, I, I get, I'd love to imagine this. Like, hey, man, you yeah. should check out Japan. <laughs> Go to my hometown, you know? And Lafcadio's like, that sounds, that's fascinating. That sounds interesting. And then, and then he went yeah. and he went to Japan yeah. and the rest is history. So Takamine sure. is this like golden boy coming in like wh wherever he walks, all of these interesting cultures sprout behind him, including yeah, Koji. Right. No, and he, he just had incredible ways of, of connecting with people. I mean, so that's fascinating that that home still exists in yes. in New Orleans. It's there. And I, so uh, analogous to that in 1905 at the St. Louis World's Fair, the Japan Pavilion was actually a replica of a summer palace uh, right. from the royal family. Yes, and when when the World's Fair ended, the, the emperor gave the summer palace to Jokichi Takamine. He broke <laughs> it down and shipped it by train to the Catskills in upstate New York, <laughs> and then horse and buggied it to his estate, right. where it's part of a private club called the Marowald Club, which was established in the eighteen seventies. Right. How did a Japanese immigrant get into a private club in the Catskills in the in the early twentieth century? I, because he's he royalty. Answered. You know, and also oh, money yeah. talks, I'm sure. Um, yeah. But can you yeah. imagine, like, a, it's a great story, but it's like, can you imagine the emperor's like, you know, hey, hey bro, just take this palace. Just take it. Yeah. You can have it. I don't it. want it. I don't, I don't want it. it. Yeah, I, I mean, one. realistically, Takamine probably paid a lot to, to ha make that happen. I, I don't oh, think sure, it was just sure. like the emperor's just like, hey, yo, you want this? Like, I, don't, <laughs> I think he was, yeah. like, I think he was deeply involved in that from, from the get go. And also, what yeah. are you going to do? Ship another palace back to Japan? We've got tons of palaces in Japan. Yeah. Yeah. You know, leave it in the States. Yeah, he so basically was the disposal unit for the for the Japan Pavilion. He was the teardown right. crew for <laughs> yeah for clearing out the fairgrounds. Uh, but so it turns out the reason he could become a member of the Marowald Club is that his wife's sister was married to the founder. Well, that helps. That Connections was, that help. Was the, yep, exactly. So so he was able help. to buy a hundred acre estate and put this. It's called Shofuden. It still exists, and I was able to visit it when I was uh, in New York in August. Uh, it's being renovated now by a family who's uh, been longtime members of the club. They acquired the property recently and they've started a renovation and it has a weird history. It was like a, it was a restaurant in like the 1950s. It was a restaurant. Well, was it a Japanese yeah. restaurant? I like to think it was like a Benihana with like the guys doing that. <laughs> it was definitely a Japanese restaurant, but it's not clear exactly what their menus were right. or anything like that. But, but uh, as I was, they let me just sort of wander around the property and they were like, be careful. Some of the floors are a little, you know, dilapidated, whatever. But as I wandered around, I went into one storage room and it was all the old chairs and tables from the restaurant. Oh man, and like the, wow. and like the host, the hostess stand and all of that sort of thing. So it's it's this weird sort of hodgepodge. Unfortunately, the, all of the original artwork was torn out by the previous owner and, and shipped back to Japan. Oh, okay, so, well at least it was saved. Yeah, so if you go up to, there's actually now a museum, a Shofuden museum installation up uh, in his hometown. Uh, Where is that, in Toyama? Toyama, yeah, in Toyama. In, is it ta ta Taoka Takoka? Hmm. So I should have remembered these words. But, well, uh, no, it, it, but yeah. I'm glad it was. I'm glad it wasn't just like you know tossed out with the garbage or something. You know, oh, no, when, during a road. A, <clears throat> you can go and see it. Fortunately, um, but it's it's been fascinating for the family as they've because they had he built an elaborate Japanese gardens right in Shofuden up in the mountains in the in the in the forest there in in, uh, in the Catskills <clears throat> and as 
but you can imagine over the last hundred years, nature's taken over. 120 years, nature's taken sure. over again. And so they're just like unearthing like statues and right. stone lanterns and the little stone bridge for crossing over what used to be a little stream, you know, all that sort of thing. So it's a, it's been a kind of fascinating discovery for the family uh, who, who acquired the property. But I'm glad that they're, they're renovating it. I have no idea how authentic it will be. Sure. But I also feel like it's such a part of the Marowald Club that that's where it belongs. Well, I'm just glad it's being, you know, loved, you know, and, yeah. and, and being taken care of. Because, you know, Takamine is not really widely remembered. He's remembered in Japan by people yeah. like of a certain age. You know, I, I don't think he's widely remembered in the States, even though like he founded like the Japan Club in New York City. He donated quietly. And, and like th this is part of the reason he isn't he isn't remembered so well, because he, he kind of did a lot of things behind the scenes deliberately. Mm -hmm. He donated all of the 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 cherry blossoms to Washington, D.C., all of those cherry blossoms. They're from Taka. They were they were funded by Takamine. I think they were gifted under the name of a different organization, but they're his. Mm -hmm. That's you right. know, and uh, so many things he's and he's buried in the Bronx, the, the Bronx Cemetery. Right. Yeah, Woodlawn in his, Cemetery. In yeah. Amazing mausoleum. It looks like something out of the thriller video. Um, yeah. I like yeah. to think of like, you know, maybe a Halloween he'll come out and we can talk to him about the Takamine whiskey process for like, you know, <laughs> one at midnight, you know, when the when the yeah. clock strikes midnight. But yeah. uh it, it's just it's great that his 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 you know descendants mm -hmm. are, are kind of keeping keeping the, the torch. Uh, alive, so to speak. That's right. Yeah, I think Japanese, when I talk to Japanese people about him, they, and you're right, it's of a certain generation, they learned about him in school as the guy with adrenaline and the cherry blossoms, but that's all they yeah. really know about him. And he, he had such a rich life and, and he, yes. he left such a legacy, right? I mean, yeah. his, the pharmaceutical company that he established during his life here in Japan is what, Daichi Sankyo? Yeah, it's 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 a major major pharmaceutical company, and I think yep. it's like you know it's been it's been reorganized and changed hands and and things mm -hmm. like that. But that's his legacy, you right. know. Not many people because when did he pass away? It was like nineteen twenty two. Twenty two, right? Not many people can say a hundred years later that their legacy is still going strong. You know that yep. that they're and his very much is, and especially. I like to think that his his spirit is 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 kind of sitting behind uh, you know you and 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 Christopher for making this re resurrecting the Takamine process whiskey. Uh, yep. It's such an amazing amazing thing you guys have done. Oh, thank you. Yeah, this is the Takamine whiskey not available in Japan. No, it was just crazy. We have, we, have, to me. we have to mule it back back from the states whenever we visit. And I, it felt so illicit when we were drinking it. Like, ooh, wait. On the other hand, though, I mean, it was made for the American market to begin with. That's right. Um, yeah. I don't think in in eighteen you know ninety x whatever year yeah. it was that whiskey yeah. was widely being consumed in Japan, and yep. uh, uh, it, it's so it, it is kind of fitting. But it's it's a it's a just a wonderful, mild in the best sense of the term drink I, I just you know it, you, you really you can taste the, the elements of the coach or you can I, I really think it the the way that it modifies the barley you know what I mean in that process is it's just so fun. it's 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 somehow familiar and exotic at the same time mm -hmm. I, I don't know it's just it's great I, I really hope it gets even more it does even better for you than it's already doing well I think but I hope it I just appreciate keeps that yeah the the uh the the um I think the, the what makes it familiar is that it's it's using virgin oak, which is the American style, right? That's how bourbon's made, and a lot of American whiskeys use virgin oak rather than reuse tap. <laughs> uh, so that gives you that familiarity. But then the koji adds your umami and all the other character and body that you that, that's frankly lacking in a lot of malt whiskeys. And so sure. I think that's where you're getting that familiar with the with the new or the different. Uh, is those yeah. two, the combination of those two elements, but yeah, it's 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 been uh, very well received. I think uh, Onkaku Spirits should be really proud of what they've uh, been able to achieve with that, and Absolutely. and hopefully, yeah, hopefully more more people find it and and enjoy it. Um, and I, I, you know, I hope I hope that some American distillers start making koji with their own, yeah, right, like that. Well, it's a style, it, right? You know, it's right, yeah. exactly. It was a style of started in America. Yeah. If if it wasn't for the Sherman Act breaking up the Illinois Whiskey Trust in 1895, then it would it could have been an established style of American whiskey by the early 20th century. Well, I just think it's it's so ironic and cool that Japan's first the, the first Japanese whiskey is actually a, a U.S. Japan collaboration. 
Mm -hmm. that it was born in America, in the heart of America. We're talking like Illinois, you know, Chicago, yeah. like yeah. The, the, this, it's the heart of America. And uh, it, it just, I don't know, it, it is such a crystallized moment of, of early kind of globalization in the best sense of the term of, of cultural exchange of, of appropriation in the best sense of the term, a Japanese person taking this, this Western liquor, adding his own spin to it, trying to sell it to Americans. I mean, it's, it's just great. It, it's really great. And, and it's important, I think, that uh, Honkaku uh, uh, spirits brought it back to life. I mean, for the first time in 100 years, right? I yeah, mean, it, I mean, well, the whiskey, yeah, the whiskey was being made in the 1890s. And by all accounts, not, it was never sold as its own brand because the new owners of the distillery after the trust was broken up, they reverted to malting right away. So it was only made for right. three or four months. Uh, as a Was it ever product. sold? I, I, I'm almost positive it was just blended into other products because they were right. they were making mass market whiskeys right like, let's remember the reason they were using koji is it actually made the mash bill cheaper. cheaper it was cheaper to use koji than it was to use malted grains uh because you're cutting out the maltsters right, right. which were, were their own little no, i love the maltsters i like fruit, to think of myself right? as a maltster <laughs> 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 but but you know they had they had uh they had their own business to protect and that's what we believe it was the cause of the fire was unhappy monsters or, sure. or or their henchmen coming in and trying to take care of business but um you know what he was making at that time was was not intended to be like a premium elegant spirit no. it was really to make cheaper whiskey for the mass market and Which there was a huge demand for because americans were total effing alcoholics back then. <laughs> right <laughs> <laughs> There's a reason yeah. prohibition happens, yeah. right? So I think that, but I think that got blend. I think whatever he had made for those three, three or four months was just blended into other distillates and it just sold without any acknowledgement that it was this unique Takamine process. Right. Because right. he had right. sued to get his patent back and in federal court and, you know, losing that lawsuit. But I'm sure the, the new owners were probably sensitive to doing anything, commercializing his, his specific recipe. Uh, given that they, they had just been sued over it. So that's my, that's all, that's all sus supposition. I haven't seen any documentation around that, but. Yeah, it's too bad there isn't more documentation around that. As you know, yeah. I'm sure that there's very, there, there's a Japanese language biography of him written by a friend, mm -hmm. I think shortly after he died in the 1920s. Mm -hmm. Yep. Very written in very flowery Japanese. It's very, it's, it's not easy to, to work your way through. I haven't yep. made it through the entire thing yet. And then there's the, his, his, his descendants published a, a kind of, it, it's almost like a guidebook. It's not really like a, there's no narrative. Mm -hmm. it, it's almost like a kind of this year, this happened and he exchanged these letters to this people kind of thing, but it's very useful. It's I'm glad it exists. Um, was, but there's people about him out there. Do you know if his friend was Kawakami? Is that who wrote his I biography? Believe, yeah, Kawakami, I believe is the one who wrote the Japanese uh, biography of him. English oh, translation. He, Oh, there is an English translation. What am I struggling through the Japanese for? Is that still that can't still be in print? No, no, no. This is this is the original printing, 1928. This is the first edition, and probably the last I, edition. I hate to say that I found. Yeah, that I was that I found. It's, it's an eighty that? page, eighty page book. It's or seventy five page book. It's very very thin. Oh, right. too bad. Is it, is it a page turner? Is it? Is it? I have, like... I have not read it yet. I'm almost I'm almost afraid. What I want what I what I actually do is make a PDF of it, yes. put it on Google Google Books. Please. So any, anybody can access it and then please, please, please. and then preserve this one. I don't actually want to read this copy because I'm afraid. Yeah, of yeah, yeah. No, I understand. Those old books, although there there are ways of rebinding them in a in a mm -hmm. in a kind of legitimate way that that won't compromise the the kind of authenticity of them. Uh, sure. If you're interested, we should talk about that offline. Yeah, let's do that. But yeah, I, I was really happy to find this. Wow. Uh, when I was in, the I wonder if that's like the only. There must be one like in the Library of Congress or something. But that, yeah, there's got to be a handful be. of them. Yeah, Cle clearly, I've become a little bit of a Jokichi Takamine yeah, otaku. You, well, if anybody deserves <laughs> to be one, it's you. <laughs> so yeah, um, very cool conversation. Really appreciate you coming on. Yeah. Why don't we? No, I uh, love talking about Jokichi. Already, already up to almost fifty minutes. So we're running long. Uh, so we're going to move on to newly opened. So this is. Uh, let's talk about some booze that we've opened recently that we've okay. we've been enjoying. And yeah, what do you got? I actually have a, a bottle here. I was I was hip to this by a friend of mine, Claren, mm. and uh, I was on a kind of a rum kick uh, over the the course of the last year, just to shake things up a bit. I like the uh, Jamaican stuff, the funkier stuff, you know, Smith yep. and Cross, Appleton Estate. 
Um, I like plantations uh, as sort of offerings that are from Jamaica. They make a really the Jamaica. Uh, they have a lot of fun ones in there too. But um, I was recommended this by a friend of mine, Daniel Morales, who is a, a home brewer and a, a kind of Japan hand. Uh, mm -hmm. And it is funky. Clarin, Clarin yep. is it's from, so it's Haitian. It's like Haitian, yep. Haitian sugar cane yep. distilled rum. Yep. And yes, it's actually, it's more, I guess, is that if I'm remembering my designations, right, it's almost more of an, an agricultural style where they're using the cane itself yeah. rather than the molasses. Yeah. Unaged, as you can see, there's no aging, you know, no yep. ages were harmed in the making of this. Uh, <laughs> and it is, it's just the, 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 the fermented umami nose on it is, is almost, mm -hmm. it's, it, it's borderline like, you know how when something like a fruit starts to almost rot, mm -hmm. but it's still mm -hmm. like incredibly sweet. Like, yeah. you, you know what I mean? It, it, it's, it's, yeah. that's, that's what you're getting off of the nose of this. And it's so complex Wild. for something that's unaged. Um, yeah. I don't know that I would like want to be sipping on this all night long, but it's certainly like, whoa, you know, kind of a, a, a you know, a shaky out of your, your yeah. uh, uh, complacency uh, sort of thing sure. to drink. Yeah, no, I've, I've had a little bit of Claire and I was turned on to that recently as well. Uh, I guess last summer is when I tried it for the first time. And I brought a bottle back with me this time just to to understand a little bit better. But you're right, it's 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 very, it's got a lot of body and umami almost yeah. character. But they had, you're right, they're kind of overripe fruit and that sort of thing. I, I, have, a, I have a feeling like it'd make a really good daiquiri. Yeah, yeah, I could see that. You know, I, I'm not actually a big fan of of mixing the agricoli uh, style rums into into cocktails, but this like it's the, the Okinawan brown sugar has that mm -hmm. same kind of sweet, like sickly, not sickly. That makes it sound bad, but like cloying, sweet, mm -hmm. like fermented, very fermented sort of aroma to it. That kind of rough sugar and that, I, you you this this actually really the clarin really reminds me of that okinawan uh you know uh, kokuto, the they call it in japanese yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, you get it you get a kind of feel for that it, it's it's really fun i definitely want to spend some more kind of time getting to know it yeah yeah our our uh, our uh frequent listeners here on japan distilled are very familiar with kokuto sugar from all the time oh, sure. yes. about kokuto shochu and that kind of thing yes um i i'm a uh, my newly open is actually it's newly open, but it's a pretty old packaging. This is a actually oh, a love pretty it. shochu. This is a chestnut shochu from Shikoku, and it, it's called um, in they have English on the box that it came in Shimanto Mysterious Reserve, That's and it's great. so mysterious that they don't report an ABV anywhere on the packaging. I think there might have been like a piece of paper in the box originally, but that's right. long gone. Um, I don't know how old it is, but I get so much oxidization on it. It has all of those deep, rich aromas that you get from like a long aged awamori because it's been sitting in this pot for a while. Sure. Um, but also some of the almost sometimes I'll get like almost a bitterness, sherry like quality uh, from the oxidization as well. So it's really, really interesting. Uh, unfortunately, I think I need to drink it relatively quickly because these little corks don't. Yeah, this course very well. So Shimanto Shimanto Gawa runs through Shikoku. It's uh, which is a, which is a kind of far flung you know region of Japan. It's not you know on a lot of tourist itineraries and things like that. Um, beautiful, beautiful place, amazing place. Shikoku. It's the, one of the four major uh, biggest islands of Japan. Yep. Yeah. And uh, yeah, that's it. Looks like Shimanto Shuzo, so Shimanto Distillery. Um, yeah. Yeah. I'd be interested have to not, try it. Have not been to. Uh, to Shikoku, it's high on my list of places I want to visit. Uh, not hard to get to from Kyushu either. I mean, this in no, no, not at all. It's famed for yeah. udon, uh, Sanuki udon, which yeah. is which is a lot of fun. Uh, it's Hiroko and I when we visited a couple years back, we actually there's a there was an udon restaurant on the grounds of a Shinto shrine. Like the Shinto priest was actually <laughs> running this this like noodle stand, I guess, to kind of keep right. the, the shrine going. It was great. It was really oh, amazing. Yeah, 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 yeah. There's a lot of places like that. It's a unique place in Japan. I highly yeah, recommend no going. It's supposed to be great for cycling too. So I'm hoping to get over Why, there with right? my bicycle yeah. sometime. Ride the yes, coast. Definitely. Um, yeah, my favorite sushi chef here in Fukuoka actually ran an izakaya in, in Kochi. Oh, for wow. About okay, 20 great. years. And so he specializes in actually the smoke, the hay smoked bonito, which is one of the. Oh, man. Local, yeah, I love that kind specialties. of stuff. So he often serves that, that as like your as the appetizer before you get into the, the nigiri course in, in his restaurant. Oh, that sounds um, great. He had never, sorry, I'm going to talk food for a second. He had never 
apprenticed at a sushi restaurant or anything like that, never worked in a sushi restaurant. He ran the Sezakaya for 20 years. And then when he moved to Fukuoka, decided he wanted to do Edomai sushi. Oh, wow. And within six months of opening, he had a Michelin star. Oh, wow. Good for him. Jeez. Now I have the guy to, knows how, the guy knows I have how to head out there. He, he, now, I think he's changed. But when he first opened, uh, uh, discovered him shortly before he, or just shortly after he opened, I think before he got his star, um, he has an eight seat counter. And he would do one seating a night, but only four people. Oh, he wow. didn't think he could maintain quality so, enough. This this kind of I think tacks back to something we were talking about earlier. That kind of otaku obsessive, like oh, they wouldn't in this context. It's not otaku; it's shokunin. It's 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 craftsman, yeah. craftspersonship. You know, right, I, right, right. I I've been having a lot of discussions with people here. The, the Japanese craftspeople are not as obsessed with monetizing what they're doing, I think, as craftspeople in the, in the West are. And there's much more of a sense that as long as I'm making enough to keep this going, mm -hmm. I'm doing the Lord's work or the commies yep. work, uh, as yep. it were. And uh, you, you just don't see that a lot in the West where it's like, oh my God, I'm going to start an empire like, you know, Wolfgang Puck. You know, I've, yeah. I've pioneered this California style pizza. Now I'm going to make a, you know, now I'm going to make a billion dollars. You know, you just, you don't get that here in, in almost any sphere. You don't sure. see it in, 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 you know, outside of maybe the consumer electronics sphere, but that's not really craftsmanship in the sense we're talking about. Right. Um, you know, it's why you don't see a lot of distilleries or breweries really making huge, you know, bounds abroad. They're just only kind of starting to, and they're still kind of niche presences and things like that. Mm -hmm. And in my field of toys, antique toys and modern toys, I love Japanese playthings. There's a lot of craftsmanship there and not a mm -hmm. lot of expanding abroad from some of the, the top creators. So it's, it's interesting. And I think your sushi chef is, is a kind yeah. of, I'm only going to seat four people tonight because that's the yeah. way to do it. You see this in the coffee world too. The Japanese, yep, exactly. you know, blue bottle is based on yeah. Japanese coffee you know, mm -hmm. culture. Why yeah. didn't a Japanese person launch Blue Bottle and make a billion dollars right. off that? You right. know, it's, right. it's yeah. same sort of thing. Yeah, no, you're absolutely right. And But I appreciate that that attention to detail, that craftsmanship. Oh, yeah. That the, that the, the, the craft itself is is what's important, not, not the uh, financial gain from it. So, cool. Definitely. Well, this has been a great conversation. Really appreciate yes. you coming Thanks on. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Hopefully not your last time. Maybe we'll... No, uh, definitely specifically focus on cocktails next time even though about the first half of the show ended up being cocktails. yeah i'd, I'd love to i'd I love to do great. another cocktail talk yeah okay i'd, I'd love to and then if, if i might pitch if i'm if i might shill a little bit here if you enjoyed my my kind of you know cultural historical stuff i'm really interested in the cultural and historical underpinnings of what makes japan cool in 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 the kind of world today and i wrote a book about that it's called pure invention oh, how japan made the modern world and uh, cocktails are not, uh, uh, and alcohol is not really uh, focused on there. I talk more about uh, Japanese fantasies like anime, manga, Walkman, karaoke and stuff. But there's a lot of parallels, I think, yep. uh, certainly with craftsmanship. So please check it yeah, out. No, by all, by all means, please pick up a copy of Matt's book, any of his <laughs> books. And also, so where can we find you on social? What's where can people? I'm I'm, I'm everywhere you are. Uh, I'm on Twitter, <laughs> Matt underscore Alt. I'm on Facebook. I'm on Instagram, Alt Matt Alt. I'm on. I even started TikTok badly. Um, but <laughs> you know, you tune me? in, tune in, and, and check me out. I, I'll follow back. I, I I enjoy interacting with people. So uh, let's let's okay. let's have a drink online together. There we go. Yeah, and uh, hopefully I'll be back in Tokyo before too long. We'll Please. be able to share some more cocktails and yeah, if you make it, but make it down to Fukuoka, always happy to show you around. I love, Maybe love to go down up. there. Absolutely. Once the, I definitely, <laughs> thanks for having me. Great. Thank you. If you'll stay on uh, after we end the broadcast, just chat sure. for a minute, but yeah. everyone, uh, thank you so much for joining. Uh, we hope you enjoyed this episode of show Tuesday here with Matt Alt. I'm Steven Lyman, your host, and please stay healthy, stay happy and come pie.